excited about the relaunch of Hux and uh, what we call Hux 2.0. We've been working on this for almost two years, and I thought the best way for us to share with you our vision and our excitement is for you to see the inaugural faculty, the faculty of the first cohort, uh, interacting with each other about the humanities and other things that we find interesting. So what I'd like to do is just kind of throw out a question to get us started. Uh, we all represent different disciplines, the five disciplines of the humanities, uh, but we're teaching in a humanities program. So what do you see as the value of a humanities program uh, in contrast to a discipline-specific program, and specifically as it applies to a graduate-level program? Sure, I, I think that one of the great advantages of studying philosophy, which is my discipline in the context of the other humanities, is that you get a breadth there that enriches the sort of questions that we ask in philosophy. Questions about what the human being is and what the good life is for human beings, that's only gonna be enriched by dealing with literature and art and music and history. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really easy in a discipline-specific program to sort of lose sight of the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. You get caught up in a lot of the technical details and methodologies and approaches, which is wonderful, but the question of why do we need to study philosophy or music or art or history, what what is the sort of impetus for that? I think, you know, humanistic inquiry is the thing that binds all of those things together, and so having a platform to do that is really nice. One of the things that I've seen over the years is that uh, different disciplines can fall into kind of a bunker mentality yeah. where, or a territorial mm -hmm. mentality where you become interested in defending your turf. And we've all discovered in our own research and teaching that that's, you know, that, that's uh, counterproductive to exploring the issues of the day, the exciting mm -hmm. issues that we have in, uh, in the humanities. Yeah. I would agree, and one of the things that drew me to art history, which is my specialized discipline, is art plus history, mm -hmm. so I felt automatically there was some breadth there and the need to know mythology mm -hmm. and literature built into art history, but then art history can get into its own sort of silo, mm -hmm. and um, that's one of the reasons I like our program. We can avoid that. There, and, there's uh, a fascinating text that I've used in studying and teaching Roman history. <clears throat> ancient Roman history about the portraits of, the, of Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. And it's clear that his uh, sculptors were following a political program and how they mm -hmm. sculpted him. One of the things they did, for example, was to sculpt him with a little lock of hair, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is not the way they Romans wore their hair. Yeah. And the reason they did that is because they were imitating ancient busts of Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. They were pitching the young uh, Augustus as the return of Alexander. Mm -hmm. So studying the art, and the history then also reveals the politics, the propaganda, uh, and you know, attempt at legitimization of uh, the first Roman emperor. And there the, are, oh, so, right. sorry, John, the, the arts are the best way to get your propagandistic message that's across. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and the disciplines do uh, interlock in terms of the you know meaningfulness of types of representations mm -hmm. that uh, humankind has come to. Uh, express themselves uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, and music is no exception to that. The history of music, the philosophy of music, uh, all of the great musicians from various cultures and times uh, being locked into their own uh, lives of, of full of literature and art themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so and the way in which music interacts with culture and reflects the movement of the culture. I think right. it's fascinating and it mm -hmm. has to be taken into account. Yeah. Part of what I think I'm hearing that all of us are sort of um, interested in and picking up on, which is great, is this idea that none of these disciplines are produced in vacuums, right? Which right. is one of right. my favorite things to say to students, that this literature doesn't just appear, for instance, right? And also that, you know, as Jim was saying, um, that literature in particular um, is really kind of closely knit with politics, so that, you know, my favorite example is I say to them, in Pride and Prejudice, when Lizzie Bennet rejects her suitors, her ridiculous cousin, Mr. Collins, that's not real, right? Like in the Regency you know, period of England, a woman of her sort of age, in her financial situation could not reject him, but this is Austen saying, this is the world as I sort of see it, as it ought to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interacting with sort of gender and yes. you know, representations of women, which you know, really links up into art and all of that. And so the students, I think, um, you know, really, I think see the value 
Right. So when Mr. Collins tells her, uh, you can have no guarantee that you'll ever receive such an offer again. Exactly. That was true. <laughs> that was absolutely <laughs> true, right? Yeah. That's a fantasy for her to say, no, I will marry for love, right? But it's a fantasy mm. that I think is um, linked into human expression, right? And so the question of what is it that these people, this culture, this moment, this historical moment um, is trying to express is also something that we're all mm. um, thinking through when we're studying. And the fact that that was pro prophetic of the direction yeah, culture has yes. taken. Absolutely. Um, so is that why we read Jane Austen now? Well, Because it predicts the direction we were heading. I, I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to ask. There are, there are you know, you'll have to ask the Austinites, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. The people who are obsessed with her. But, but at least possibly, you know, there's a potential for that. Definitely. Interesting. Yeah. I, thinking about the way that the discipline sort of cross-pollinate in this way. I, last week in, in one of my philosophy classes, I was teaching Boethius, the Constellation mm -hmm. of Philosophy. And it was great to be able to teach the students how this idea of Lady Fortune, the depiction of Lady Fortune in that text comes from, you know, hit sort of classical uh, literature, yeah. mm -hmm. how Boethius ends up influencing literature, you know, through the, the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance mm -hmm. and early modern era, and people like Chaucer, and, um, and also in art, we saw a lot of different depictions of, of Lady Fortune in painting, and then we also listened to Orff's um, O Fortuna from Carmina Burana mm. as an example of, of it showing up in music. And this theme of Lady Fortune being a monster. Mm -hmm. um, to see how that idea carried forward through you know, all the centuries in the different art forms. That's so great. I think that's another example of the way that the disciplines interacting like that can, can really enrich your understanding. And, and like Jane said, see how it's not just in a vacuum. It's not like these ideas are locked away you know, in the classroom, but right. they're part of what's shaping culture. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be uh, helpful to talk about the theme of the first cohort, self and technology, mm -hmm. in light of the interaction of the various disciplines of the humanities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Well, I kind of see the theme from the point of view of self, technology, and this really, for me, interesting time in the 60s when there were new technologies that might seem very outdated to us now, and <laughs> interest in what would the relationship be between the artist and the automated technology? Mm. Could the artist still have um, a hand in the creation, or is it going to become mechanical creation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the question about the, the camera originally in the exactly. 19th, 20th century. Is mm. there room for art anymore now that we have a camera that can capture perfectly yes. reality? Yeah. Yes. Well, Walter Benjamin has that very yes. famous art right. in the age, right, of mechanical reproduction. And that's still a question. Um, that we're asking with digital media and sort of, you know, copyright and outsourcing mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. You know, what constitutes mm -hmm. art, right? Yes. Um, and so, it's and what would your question. role be as the artist, the writer, the yeah. composer? Um, and I think there's sort of a question of respect for the individual in that mm -hmm. story of technology and the self, mm -hmm. and um, how much. Control, maybe, is another part of the story and another word. How much control? And sometimes you, he I hear in the art world, well, that's digital. So they just made a collage. Yeah. Some artists made a collage. Did something. It, it sort of suggests that there's not a lot of talent required. Or authenticity. You know, or authentic exactly. Yeah. Those are really important questions that I think our first cohort theme is going to get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and to pick up on the theme of control, um, one of the programmatic statements uh, that has shaped modern philosophy of, of technology comes from Descartes' mm -hmm. Discourse on Method, where he's trying to articulate a new foundation for how to pursue truth in the sciences. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he says toward the end of that text is that this new method will make us masters and possessors of nature. Mm -hmm. And so he envisions that as a good thing. It will make life much easier, more convenient, and it will also allow us to have great advances in, in medicine and preventing illness. Mm -hmm. And so those advantages are undeniable, but it turns out to be sort of a fateful statement as well because yes. that 
also with becoming masters and possessors, there's also a sense in which technology makes us mastered and possessed. <laughs> and so that's one of the philosophical questions, I think, that is really important in our time. How does it change the way that we relate to the world and to ourselves Absolutely. and to each other? Yeah. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity there yeah. in terms of... Well, in the unintended consequences of technology, uh, mm -hmm. the story of New York City, they uh, many years ago had a pollution problem. Mm -hmm. The pollution problem wasn't smog, it was manure. Mm -hmm. Because the horses did everything, pulling carts, uh, transporting people, as well mm -hmm. as bringing supplies in and out. Mm -hmm. And they were taking away manure by the, uh, you know, the truckloads, or well, the barge loads, literally. Mm -hmm. So the streetcar was the answer for that, and eventually, of course, morphed into uh, gas-powered uh, machines, uh, mm -hmm. cars, and other means of transportation, which then created their own problem. Exactly. Which perhaps is worse than horse manure, <laughs> I don't know, I guess. Depends on your, on your perspective. But I think that's one of the issues that we deal with over and over, and still in the 21st century, we invent technologies to resolve a problem, but then they end up creating other problems or right. complications that we hadn't anticipated because we hadn't yet lived in that world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think something that, <clears throat> that you're articulating that's important is that you know, we can think about technology in a really wide range of ways. So not just sort of steam power technology or digital technology or, you know, but I'm thinking about, um, you know, writing as technology, medicine, mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. as technology, right? So when students, students tend to have a very deterministic outlook on, on technology mm -hmm. when you ask them, you know, do you think, you know, what do you think about the mastery or mastered question? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, technology is great, but, you know, it dehumanizes us and, you know, so on and so forth. And I said, well, what about vaccines, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. for right. instance, right, yes. which is a very important technology yes. um, that is endemic to the way in which we live our lives now, right, has changed lifespans and sort of culture, you know. Um, and so thinking about technology in, in more than one register is, right. I think, something that's yes. um, advantageous about this theme. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, one of the questions I'm really interested in in my work is the technologies of the self, mm -hmm. you know, the different means by which we try to shape ourselves and transform mm -hmm. ourselves in yeah. different ways. And so if we think of it in that broader sense, I mean, you go to the grocery store and in the checkout aisle, you see magazines saying, you know, lose that gut oh, yeah. or, <laughs> you know, your best sex life now, all of those sorts of questions also, yes. you know, involve this idea that through the right technique, we yes. can master ourselves, possess ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. be our best self now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Weber, Max Weber once said, Stadtluft macht frei, the city air makes you free. And even though we're not talking in terms of urbanization, we're already an urbanized society, but in many ways, uh, modern digital technology is an extension of that. That you have the freedom to redefine yourself. You no longer define by who's whose child you are, mm -hmm. what town you grew up in, and what you and what you did in school, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but you can choose to redefine yourself. But then that's problematic. Can you really redefine yourself? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking now of you know. So a side of interest of mine is. Um, like video game culture, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about avatars and mm -hmm. the fact that you are right. able to literally craft a new self, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And in, including, you know, switching genders and switching races and ethnicities, mm -hmm. um, ages. And so that's interesting, right? In, in terms of how you see yourself as well as how you're projecting yourself and what that means yes. um, and whether that's problematic or whether it's liberating, I mean, mm -hmm. is something that we're still grappling yeah, it's with. That's probably both, that's right? Really yeah. interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Well, I mentioned that we would talk about graduate study in the humanities. Mm -hmm. um, anything you'd like to say specifically with regard to a master's program in the humanities, the value of that? I am really excited about a master's program in humanities such as the one we have created mm -hmm. where the topics can be pollution or the topic can be investigating technology. So. A student can take the questions of, you know, what is it to be human? Mm -hmm. And here are literary depictions, philosophical treatises, music, but also apply that knowledge to solving social problems mm -hmm. or the problems of urbanism mm -hmm. so that the humanities graduate student is not isolated and is actually in the world using the skills you get from learning how to analyze problems and look at different uh, media and their responses to issues and then apply it to what I guess we like to call the real world. Mm -hmm. I think that's 
a wonderful reason to study humanities at the graduate level. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, it's very easy for students of the liberal arts in general right now, right, um, to feel like they're studying something that is archaic or outdated um, because their programs just haven't been updated um, to really impress on them, you know, what is the, the real world applicability of what they're learning. Yeah. And of course, we know when we're in the discipline that it's absolutely applicable, right, in the sense that we are it, it, to my mind, in my opinion, I think that we are crafting people who are better thinkers, who will become better citizens, right? I mm -hmm. mean, who will be more yes. responsible when they're thinking through choices that they're making, even if they go into business or engineering or, you know, whatever it is, um, but that it becomes a sort of foundation in thinking about crucial issues that are, you know, undergirding these um, other kinds of, of decisions that they make. Yeah. Yeah. yeah those, so those those questions, you know, what does it mean to yeah. be human? What yeah. is a human being? What is the good life for human beings? How should we live? Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of people should we be? What can we know? Mm -hmm. You know, what what is reality? Yeah. You know, Kristen right. used yeah. the, the the term reality. What mm -hmm. what is reality? How can we know it? Those questions don't go away. They're with us, you know, as they've always been, and it's important that we keep asking them. Because the culture keeps asking them. Yes. So we need to, to pay close attention. Well, we need leaders who can think in terms of uh, medical ethics, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because we can do something, should we do something? Mm -hmm. Well, right. mm -hmm. I think most would agree that that can be a distinction. Just because we can't do it, maybe we shouldn't do it. Uh, the Nazis did some interesting, you know, medical experiments that we would define as torture, mm -hmm. and information was learned from them that couldn't have been learned without doing vivisection, but was that right? Should we even use the information that they left behind? Those are some questions that have been asked in the past, and in the 21st century, technology, advances in technology continue to raise new questions about, you know, because it's possible to do this, should we do it? Mm -hmm. Should we have the designer you know, genetics, mm -hmm. so that you can design your child exactly mm -hmm. as you would want them to be. Exactly. And uh, apart from questions of, of kind of a technical genocide, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to eliminate certain things. You, everyone's going to be six feet or taller, every you know, male's going to be six feet or taller, or whatever the ideal is supposed to be, um, is the question of uh, unintended consequences, is the question of when you focus on designing, you know, a genetic uh, person, a designing person from the DNA up, what kinds of statements are you making about humanity? What does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's not a coincidence that the 20th century saw developments like the Turing test, mm -hmm. right? Where right. you are actually testing, you know, whether this machine can pass for human or not. Um, I have a friend actually who wrote a book called The Most Human Human, where he, mm -hmm. he details um, his experiences. He got to travel to somewhere in Europe, I can't remember, Sweden or Switzerland, um, where they were conducting a series of sort of really large-scale Turing tests, and he's sort of writing about his observations there, but it all comes back to this question, right? How do we define humanity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And right. just because it's a machine doesn't mean it's not human. I mean, it's a really difficult yeah. and ethical, moral sort of question yes. that isn't you know, um, really inherent to just the technology, right? Yes. That's something that we have to decide. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. When it comes to educators, um, you know, this kind of a program, uh, a lot of folks in education or going into education would take a program like this. And I can think of nothing more important than for teachers to be thinking about these things and be able to bring into the classroom the kind of leadership that we're talking about and thinking carefully, not necessarily indoctrinating students, but mm -hmm but helping them understand what it means from the point of view of the humanities to take a leadership role in thinking about technology and the self and the other issues we will deal with in our classes and how that can be brought into their classrooms and into the lives of their students. Mm -hmm. And in a way that you know, conjures the depth and, and seriousness of some of these issues, Brian talking about you know, lifelong skill sets mm -hmm. at not just doing the right thing and discovering new things, but almost defining oneself, learning about oneself through others, through, mm -hmm. through the arts, through, through historical stages of civilization or artistic movements, literary movements, uh, whereby that depth in the classroom and the education field in all kinds of career choices that uh, 
future Huck students will choose, uh, I think there's a, it might sound like a cliche, but this sort of well-roundedness that the humanities disciplines bring to that ongoing process is that, that never seems quite finalized because it can't be, mm -hmm. right? We're always going to be uh, asking ourselves questions, we'll be expressing ourselves, wishing to interpret the world that we, we wake up to every day. And so uh, I think that one of the ultimate uh, sets of values that the humanities program could bring to the future students is, is really lifelong learning tools that mm -hmm. are just applicable in so many ways. And I don't want to change the subject too much, but I was thinking about the technology issue. Uh, you know, in the early 20th century, a movement that became known as the Italian Futurists mm -hmm. embraced mm -hmm. yes. industry and technology and, and composers who I actually admire and I do the quotation <laughs> because they were actually using uh, engines on stage and running engines and making up their own mechanical instruments. Uh, that kind of getting your hands dirty and, and, and sort of embracing these, these manifesto-like beliefs, uh, I think we all sort of do that in our own mm -hmm. private way, in our own personal way. Uh, but the history of music really does uh, weave uh, deeply into the other disciplines. And I think to hunker down and to focus only on music, only on art, those, those you know, focused degrees are one thing. I think what Huck's 2.0 right is doing is really going out of its way to celebrate uh, through a theme, through the cohort theme, uh, a multidisciplinary approach mm -hmm. to some of these questions. Yeah, I can't tell you how excited I get. I mean, I'm thinking about the sort of oral, the auditory aspect of um, the things that we study. And with literature, it's so rare that we get any kind of voice, right? So the first time I heard Tennyson reading Charge of the Light Brigade, I was like, oh my God, it's his voice coming back to us, you know, from across this huge gap of time. Um, but music is really interesting because it's something that, again, I hadn't really studied um, when I was an undergraduate, but as a graduate student, I um, got to do more with the sort of interplay between music and literature. And it was amazing what a different perspective it offered on the literature. I was really taken aback and mm -hmm. wished that I had gotten that before because you just, you're so used to reading words on a page, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I really kind of appreciated that, yeah. I can second your story because mm -hmm. somewhere along the line in graduate school with uh, working on art history, I, I had the privilege of having some colleagues who were in the music department. I realized I had a horrible gap in my education because I would be, look, we would talk of Baroque art and someone say, well, this is a Baroque composer. Yeah. Really? It's the same? You know, so <laughs> I got a book. A friend of mine gave me a book. Jonathan probably knows. I think the author is Grout, sure. History of Music. And I tried to study it, you know, on my own. It was a little dry. <laughs> and uh, But I really tried because I realized I just have left out in my study a whole whole related yes. and yes. Uh, area. Mm -hmm. So I still have the book. I never gave it back to him. If he's watching, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> kept it. And that was my attempt to try to educate myself. Yeah. So our program, mm -hmm. I think, will start us all out from the get-go, yes. you know, with a better approach. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And now, when I teach romantic literature, I also play romantic music, right, um, which right. the students are like, I mean, and so, so yes. it's fantastic. But yeah. so speaking to your point about, you know, what is um, the advantage of having a graduate program in the humanities, I think as an undergraduate, you are still getting your bearings, right? You're learning the basics of the disciplines. But in graduate study, um, you know, both of our yeah. anecdotes are about, you know, being able to kind of do more with that once you have the foundations. That's so right. That's great. Good stuff. And these connections, I think, bring about... Uh, perhaps a deeper sense of meaningfulness when you learn, you know, about the interconnections, not just from historical movements or periods. 
and from among the multi-disciplinary uh, approaches, but always turning, turning back away to oneself uh, with, with that expectation of the richness of life that others have led in the past because it's such an inspiring story to hear your discussion of horse manure <laughs> isn't horse manure. That's, that's, that's a real rich anecdote, actually. That's, that's more than an anecdote. It's a chapter out of, uh, you know, urban living and the, the sort of uh, the atmosphere, hopefully not the odor, but the atmosphere <laughs> of, of, of city life, you know, at the turn of the century. Um, it's just a richness uh, in terms of discovering connections and, and, and my idea or my response to the, the comments about music, uh, it's ditto, it's the other way around as well. Learning about uh, Beethoven or Chopin isn't enough until you learn more about Vienna, about Paris, about a, a Polish composer living in Paris and uh, experiencing that sense of uh, separation, perhaps, or nationalism. Romanticism or the Romantic era was greatly defined by nationalistic spirits. And what does that mean in music, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, some sort of style taken mm -hmm. from the folk or uh, what have you. But anyway, those webs of connection really uh, conjure a deeper, meaningful experience of history and, and philosophy, which I'm actually quite jealous of Brian's <laughs> philosophy chops. <laughs> and I would, I would love to take your seminar, actually. Maybe uh, we could arrange that. <laughs> um, I wonder if we could change gears here for a moment and, and talk for just a moment about the cohort model that we've constructed and the symposium as a, kind of a unique features of our program. Some students might think that a model that routes them through a prescribed, prescribed set of courses without a lot of choices is confining. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what would you say to a student like that about the value of what we're doing? Yeah, the great thing about the, the cohort model is that there is a, a continuity there. You have a theme that provides continuity to the, the study that you're, you're pursuing and you're working with the same group of students building relationships. I think that's important since it is an online program. It, it allows for a sort of connection there over time. Um, and, you know, from the, out, from the outside, it might appear like that's very regimented or too limiting, but it's actually, that's providing the basis from which you can deepen your own research interests. Mm -hmm. You can expand outside of that, and that's one of the things that the cohort um, is, is building toward, is, is the colloquium where students will present their own research. So you can think of these courses not so much as just the, the core that everybody has to go through, but instead think of it, this is the basis yeah. for you to expand, yeah. for you to mm -hmm. explore the things that you find interesting. But you will have a, a connection with the other students so that you can have some sort of um, starting point for those conversations to continue. I think that's exactly right. And technology enables, you know, involvement through Skype and FaceTime and uh, the, the idea of a symposium and having a physical presence on campus at the end of the program mm -hmm. really ties things up very well, yet shouldn't scare anyone away because there's all sorts of potential for involvement through, through the technology, being part of a cohort uh, uh, is, is doesn't mean you're just sitting in front of your computer in your bedroom. You're actually part of a of a group, and that, I think that's what the experience will yeah, be: is the yeah. cohort experience. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope that the structure of the cohort will, and the courses, will provide a. Um, will each course can build upon the courses that came before, mm -hmm. because we really are pursuing a shared vision. You know, we've, like I mentioned earlier, we've met together for almost two years now, and have crafted a vision of what the new Hux can be and the theme, thematic approach and building through a, you know, a fairly tight structure of courses towards a culmination in the, in the symposium allows us to really program not just our own individual classes but think together about how we're programming a course of study. So at the mm -hmm. end of 18 to 20 months, which is what we project as the amount of time it takes to graduate, you 
not only have, you don't have a collection of three unit courses, you have a program that has been building towards a direction. And to some extent, as Brian suggested, you can craft it, students can craft that, the direction that that program is taking them. But, um, but it's, you know, it's something that, so that not only are the courses thought out carefully, but the program of study is thought out carefully. And at the end, I think, you have something greater than the whole, greater than the, mm -hmm. the sum of the parts. Right, right. I think another twist on the benefits of this model involves the faculty. Mm -hmm. because we can be closer to one another mm -hmm. and we're going through the cohort theme with the students mm -hmm. so there's a nice continuity for us you know mm -hmm. rather than teaching a course and wondering I wonder what the student ever did with <laughs> that material we'll know and we can um, mm -hmm. I think support the students mm -hmm. in a nice way because of that yes mm -hmm. yeah that's a special relationship set of relationships mm -hmm. that are unique I think that just because the classes themselves are set out for you doesn't mean that the content is restrictive. Yeah. Right? I mean, as you were suggesting, I mean, this is really, I mean, I think our conversation shows um, the many, you know, avenues in which you can pursue the theme and sort of different applications of the humanities. And so, you know, it's a place for students to really be able to develop the things that they are interested in. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I think that there's freedom in that sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think uh, we are excited about this, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I hope you've caught a little bit of our excitement. Um, we hope you can join us if uh, this is the kind of program that you find interesting, and uh, we look forward to working with you through the, uh, the terms, the five terms of uh, this program. Mm -hmm.